I used to sing the song, Spirit Lead Me, Where My Trust Is Without Borders. And I sang that song with everything inside of me and I'm in it. Um, I never thought that God would send me to the place that I'm fixing to share with you. My name is Dee Jordan. I'm 48 years old. I have been a Christian since I can remember. Um, my parents were Christians. They raised me in church from a baby. I don't even remember ever not going to church except for a few years when I was in high school, college. Decided to maybe try to figure out who I was, maybe follow the wrong people. Took a little break from, from my everyday church life, but my most fondest memories are from growing up in our church home with my family, with my church family, my youth group. Uh, it's one of my most precious memories. And most of my faith, I believe, started there. I believe before your faith can get stronger, you've got to maybe sometimes need God. And I got to a place in my youth and my uh, early college age that I sought after the wrong things and looked for the wrong things and I needed God. And he constantly was tapping me on the shoulder and reminding me that I could turn around and I could find him. And through my childhood and my life, I, I believe that God was preparing me for a time such as this. And I believe that my faith uh, through the years, through raising my children and uh, a marriage of 29 years, I believe that those things make you stronger and help build your faith over time. The scripture Luke 16.10 says that whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much and whoever is dishonest with little is dishonest with much. And so I believe that over time in my life when I trusted God in the small things, he showed up in the big things and taught me that I could trust him. And I think it takes time to hear God's voice and to learn to hear God's voice, that takes practice. People often ask me, how do you know when God's talking to you? Well, you, if you, it's just like playing basketball. If you don't practice listening to God, you're not gonna know when he's talking to you. So over time, over, over the last few years, I've learned to listen to what God has to say to me and when he speaks, I listen. I have been coming to Bethel Worship Center now for almost 26 years. Uh, it, it was a big transition from a Southern Baptist church, um, but immediately the people were the most loving, kind people. And as a 21 year old with a baby, mar newly married, it was one of the most refreshing things that I could find. And finding that home church again was what my heart desired. I knew the value of being raised in church and I wanted to raise my children in church. And being a mama was one of the most special things for me. It was a gift and uh, I never wanted God to think that I was ungrateful. So, I made sure they were here. Like my mom and dad made sure I was in church because I knew the value in it. And I'm grateful to Bethel for helping me raise my kids and helping them find the Lord. And uh, I pray that my grandkids will have that same blessing as they go through life because there's value there. So that leads me to this crazy story I'm fixing to tell you. And it's more of a story about how God gave me a miracle than it is of a story of cancer. Um, 
in early November 2022, I found a small golf ball size lump in my abdomen and just ignored it. I thought, well, it's nothing. It's no big deal. I'm just going to push it off and I'm just going to take care of everybody else. And uh, a few weeks later, I felt like it had grown. And I'd only told one or two people even that I had a concern about it and uh, thought I might need to make a doctor's appointment. So I did. And uh, a week later, I went to the doctor. I felt like it was actually growing. So I was a little concerned at this point. And immediately, my doctor sent me straight over for a CT. She was immediately concerned. She uh, didn't feel like this was uh, supposed to be there. And so uh, I thought, well, I can just go to work. I, I, I can go, I keep my grandchildren. I would just need to go. I, I, don't, I don't have to go over there right today, do I? And she said, I, I believe you need to go today. And I said, okay, all right. So then I actually had to tell my family that I had a concern of something. So looking down at this paper that says STAT on it, I'm headed over to the hospital to have a CT STAT, which I, I started to get a little concerned at that point. And so I, I sat there and of course waited for hours, had a CT, uh, waited for the results. Um, this was shortly, honestly, before our, our Christmas on fair that we have here and uh, was kind of waiting on results and wasn't real sure what was going on and a little bit of confusion about my CT, but basically what they said was, if this isn't cancer, this is a solid mass. And if you know anything about a solid mass, that's not a good thing. So uh, they said it was, if it was a solid mass, it would be sarcoma. And so we began the process of uh, having some blow work done and making doctor's appointments and getting everything I needed so that when I got to the oncology department, uh, that they would have everything they needed. And God was so in the timing and so in the details of every part of my story. So I walk into, I, I get a phone call while I'm driving down the road and, and the doctor says, well, I, I, they think it might be a solid mass. And so, of course, I'm like, okay, what, what does that mean? She's like, we're just gonna do some precautionary things and I'm gonna send you to uh, SCOA, South Carolina Oncology and Associates. And uh, that was scary in itself to hear those words. And uh, so um, we made that appointment that within three days I had that appointment. The timing was just absolutely God's timing. I met my oncologist and he reassured me that it wasn't cancer. And I said, are you sure? And something in my spirit, that small voice that you have to learn to hear told me, push further. And I said, um, I'm just not sure. And he said, I'm almost 100% positive this is not cancer. It might be a mass, might not be, but he said, let's just do a needle biopsy and find out what's going on. So they scheduled me for a needle biopsy. I had that procedure within the next week. That came back inconclusive. It had also, it had pieces of cancer and it had pieces of non-cancer. And he reassured me again. And I, that he did not feel like this was cancer. And I heard that still small voice telling me to push further. And he said, well, this is what I, I think we need to do. And I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to what, and because I believe God sent me to him and I, and I trusted him and I felt like he knew what he was talking about, but I also know the Holy Spirit leads us sometimes and even leads other people sometimes. But the, that still small voice still kept telling me to push a little bit further, but to be obedient. And I told him, I said, listen, I'm gonna do this your way for a month. 
And if I'm still uncomfortable in a month, I'm gonna, we're gonna change up what we're doing. So I'm gonna give you a month. I have to trust you because I believe God sent me here and I have to trust you. And he almost in defeat, put his head down. He said, you're just gonna have to trust me. And I said, okay. And so um, time went on. I was meeting some friends for lunch and uh, I was having a severe pain and I'm pretty pain tolerant. Uh, but my friends looked at me and said, you're in pain. And I said, yeah. And they said, you need to call the oncologist. And I said, okay, I'll do it when we get down with lunch. And uh, this is where I just knew God was almost, we were almost chuckling because I called the oncologist, I had to leave a message. But within 10 minutes, he had called me back. And he said, I just couldn't get you off my mind. And I kind of chuckled. And I said, well, I, I know why, because I've been praying that God would show you exactly what to do and what was wrong. And he said, I, I sent your, all of your paperwork and all your scans and everything over to a, a trusted friend. And she doesn't think we're being aggressive enough. He said, in fact, she thinks that my, my treatment plan is wrong. And I kind of chuckled again and uh, highly respect and uh, care for him. At this point, we've been together through a lot of things. He's a smart guy and he knows what he's talking about. Um, he said, I think we're gonna get, go in and get a good, good chunk of this thing and see what it is. And I said, okay, all right, when and where, which is kind of what I've been doing this whole time. So he said, th this was right at the New Year, so January 1st, and by January 5th, I was going in for a uh, biopsy, a full biopsy, a laparoscopic biopsy. And uh, I had so many, I didn't have but a few people that I had shared the information because I really didn't know what was going on. And I thought, well, if it's nothing, then it'd be silly to, you know, tell everybody that I might have cancer if I didn't have cancer. So going into this, still trying to figure out what exactly this mass was, uh, people would, the people who knew would say, you know, I'm gonna be praying. And I said, you know, I just need you to pray specifically that God would detach this mass from my body and that they get it out. And I can't even tell you how many people I said that to. It was just so clear that the Holy Spirit wanted me to specifically pray for it to detach itself and for them to be able to remove it. At this point, I've had three scans that show that it's inoperable, that I have no margins, that it's attached to all of my internal organs and the possibility of them removing it was impossible because I could bleed out on the table. So I was looking at a mass that was growing fast and looking at it being inoperable and not knowing what it was. So I head in for my biopsy that day and it was a long day. I had a migraine, my husband was there with me. We were in this tiny little room I was his like fifth surgery and it was after two o'clock and of course we hadn't eaten and uh, the, my headache was just about to push me over the edge and so we finally got uh, in the operating room and I was kind of glad because I just wanted to go to sleep and uh, the next thing I remember I woke up in pain a lot of pain and uh, a little nauseous and the sweetener, she uh, quickly got that under control. I probably fell back asleep. And the next thing I saw was my oncologist. And uh, he said, well, we had a change of plans. And I said, what? And he said, we got all of it. He said it wasn't attached to anything. 
and we removed it. All of it. Seven pounds. He said it was gnarly. I've never seen anything like it. He said, I still don't think it was cancer. I said, okay. And I, you know, recovery. I was half asleep. So, uh, we get, we get done. They send it off, obviously, for, to find out exactly what it is. And it was the, one of the first times I've heard the word leomyosarcoma. Uh, I've probably never heard the word until I had watched a movie prior that uh, the uh, main character had this kind of cancer and they died at the end. And when he told us what it was, I, I asked the hard questions. I asked him if he ever treated anybody with it. And if he did, did they live? And he told me some did and some didn't. And uh, if you Google, you know, like anything, if you go to Google and Leo Myo sarcoma, um, it's not going to be pretty what you find. I joined two support groups, and every time I turned around, these support groups were talking about reoccurrences and nodules and constant surgeries and I, I was overwhelmed and I felt I, I don't know I'm not even smart enough to have this cancer I don't even know what to look for to fight they're talking about all these treatments and and all these things that I have no clue about and it was overwhelming and uh, luckily I had friends and family that never, never let me think anything but positivity. When I first heard the words cancer, I think, um, you know, like anybody, I, I probably, for a lack of better words, lost it. I went to my front porch with my husband and I cried and uh, I, in my mind, made plans for what was gonna happen if I wasn't gonna be here. I never questioned where I was going if I wasn't here. I just didn't know if I was worthy enough to live. I've uh, known some really great people in my life that had cancer, some God-fearing, God-loving people who didn't live on this side of heaven. Their healing came later and I didn't, it wasn't that I didn't believe God could do it. I just didn't believe I was worthy enough of it. But I have really great friends and family who, when I would say, well, you know, the statistics aren't good. And they'd say, we don't live off statistics. And I'd say, you're right, you're right. And every time I didn't have the strength to mentally push past what I saw on paper, they were there reminding me how precious I was and how God can do anything. So, I, I thought if all these people can believe in me, I can believe in me. I'm not a quitter and I'm a fighter and I just put on the armor of God and I, I put on the blinders and I just said to myself, I've got to believe what God says. If I sit around and look at all, all these things that the internet says and all these other things and what statistics say, uh, I'm, I'm not going to make this. So I put the blinders on and I just believed what God said. And I believed that he could do it. I still question whether 
I was worthy enough of it. I still question that, but if you believe what God says, then you have to know that you're worthy. And I'm not perfect, and I'm no better than anybody else, and I don't know why God left me here. But I know that he knows that I wouldn't let it be in vain. That every minute I get to be here is a gift. And I'm going to love each day and I'm going to love each person that's in my life because I know what a blessing that it is. Um, after I got home, this, the recovery from the surgery was pretty extensive. I was cut, like they say, stem to stern to remove a seven pound mass. Um, so the recovery of that was pretty, uh, it took, it took a minute. Um, but things had to get rolling because I didn't have a choice but to start chemo. Um, in the coming weeks, so I had a port placement, I had an echocardiogram, things were, it was like a roller coaster. It was one day, it was one thing, and one day it was the next. And I, I looked at him and I asked him, I said, do I have a choice? And he said, you really don't have a choice. So I'm not sure what scared me more, the cancer, the chemo, or losing my hair. Um, I'm not afraid to say that I'm probably vain and losing my hair might have been the worst part but I guess I can laugh at that now uh, but uh, chemo the day of chemo um, well let me start back before chemo you have a chemo class and they teach you all about what's fixing to happen and the kind of chemo that I was gonna receive was what most people call the red devil and I, I walked into my chemo class and I said, you know, I, I don't really want to call it that. And she, she was the sweetest, crazy little lady that works there at SCOA. And she said, well, what do you want to call it? I said, well, I'd like to call it the blood of Christ. I said, because it just sounds better to me. And I feel like it would cover me a lot better than the, the red devil. And she laughed and she said, okay, well, we're going to call it the blood of Christ. And I said, okay, that sounds better to me. Uh, so she explained to me what my side effects would be and uh, that I was going to lose my hair and that uh, they were there to help me the whole way through. And um, that was a good feeling. Um, the chemo scared me. I, I think thinking about having a poison enter your body is, is pretty scary. And uh, I don't know if you know a whole lot about um, that particular chemo. Uh, it, they have to actually hand push it in. So they sit beside you and uh, they have a big syringe of this chemotherapy and they have to do it slowly and they have to sit there because it's so dangerous that uh, your body may react negatively to it. So the first day I walk in and I look across and there's this sweet lady having her chemo. She's half asleep. I've never met her before. And she looks at me and she says, hey baby. And I said, good morning. And she said, is this your first time? And I said, yes ma'am. And she said, you're going to be just fine. God's got this. And my little nurse walks over. And she's got a mask on, of course. And she looks just like my nurse from my daughter's house. And I said, thank you, God. For reminding me you're here. And my best, one of my best friends to this day is that sweet lady that started out talking to me that day. 
Um, my chemo sisters is who I call them. We stay in touch. They are the most precious people. When you go through something like we all did together, something changes in you and your, your heart softens and understands a lot more than it did before. So they're precious and I love them. And uh, so this nurse sits beside me and she calms me down and reminds me. And, and again, she looks just like my nurse from my regular daughter's office. And I finish and I think, oh, that wasn't so bad. And so I get home and they, they, they pour, you, pour you full of medications, the prednisone and Zofran and Finagran and things. They, they have so many things now to keep you from being too sick, which I think I watched movies and thought, I'm just going to be sick. And I'm just going to be sick. And I really wasn't too bad. There were a lot of side effects that, uh, you know, a lot of people have, but I can't complain. There, my side effects were almost, I, I, I'd be almost ashamed to complain about them because they were almost nothing. Uh, the first week is always hard right after chemo. And then, you know, right after that, things start getting better. And then you, you have chemo, most people have chemo every three weeks. So by the third week, I'd start feeling amazing and I'd start getting outside and doing those things and going to the grocery store. Uh, my white blood cell counts always stayed in a healthy level. So I was able to be out in the community when I felt like it. Uh, that was a blessing because I was able to see my grandchildren and I was able to see my children and, and lead a somewhat normal life during my chemo. Uh, somewhere between my second and my third treatment uh, is when my hair started falling out in clumps and I was almost embarrassed to leave the house. I would have to clean my shirt and I would find big chunks on the floor and I was uh, it was more than I can handle to clean up to remind me that uh, I think it's just part of a woman's body that we we value and uh, the Lord just was humbling me a, a lot and so I decided um, it was time for it to go and so I called those friends that wanted to be part of uh, my story and uh, they came, and uh, the sweet, my sweet hairdresser, Ashley, who's been cutting my hair since she was 18. Also, the daughter-in-law of a good friend of ours who died from cancer. Uh, I called her and I said, Ashley, can you, can you cut my hair? She said, I'll be there. And so, we shaved it. And I hated every second of it. And we sat around and cried and we prayed. And um, it was a precious memory of something that was so tragic for me in my life. But we moved, I moved past that. I continued on the fourth chemo, fifth chemo, and I was almost there. Um, and I had a PET scan. I don't know if many people know this, but most insurances are not going to pay for a PET scan unless you actually have cancer. And since I had finally gotten a diagnosis, we finally got a PET scan. And we found out that when he did surgery and he told me he got all of it, he did. And I was cancer free. One, two, three. And uh, I couldn't, I honestly just couldn't believe it. And uh, I, I still to this day am in awe of the fact that I am cancer free. Um, my last chemo treatment was 
in May of 2023, so almost a year ago to the day, and uh, the hair slowly growing back, but uh, my faith has grown even stronger and even bigger, and this has not only taught me, but it's taught a lot of people in my life how to that we can trust God and uh, that even when things don't look uh, good on paper that we don't see things the way that God sees things and he's our maker and he knows where we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing. I would encourage anyone who is facing something that looks so overwhelming and maybe just you can't believe how you can come out on the other side of it. And I, I hope this doesn't sound harsh, but really it's none of your business. God knows what we're supposed to be doing. He knows how the story ends. He's the beginning, the middle, and the end. So all you have to do is be faithful in every step. Today, get up. Do what you feel like today is the right thing to do. Tomorrow, get up and do what you think the right thing is to do. You have to trust. You have to trust what God puts in that little small voice when you, you've you practiced and you, you learn to listen and you learn to hear him. You have to learn to actually walk that out because you can hear him and you can ignore him or you can hear him and you can follow his, his lead. And I think so many times we, we hear him, but we just are like, maybe that wasn't him. But maybe it was so I would encourage you to to trust yourself to trust what God has for you God has all good things for you he has he has life for you um, I would say you know when we when we ask God to lead us when we trying to figure out what our purpose is when we ask God to lead us beyond the borders of our minds. And like the song says, I think sometimes we don't realize that that could lead us to a place where we're uncomfortable. I think we, we ask God to take us there so that we can do something fun or miraculous or we can save someone or we can go travel or go on mission trips or whatever you know that might look like but we forget that sometimes uh, where God wants to take us may be in an uncomfortable place a place of sickness a place of uh, pain uh, but it's also for me it was a place where I looked for an opportunity to be a blessing when I walked in the door um, to have my first treatment and I was met with, God's got this. I, I was like, I, I need to do that for someone else. So when the next person walked in the door, I tried to be that person for them. And uh, it was, I met some of the most precious, sweet people that needed the Lord and didn't know the Lord. And between me and Miss Faye, my my friend, we were able to share Christ sitting right there in a chemo room. And uh, we want to, I want to believe I made a difference. Uh, only God knows that, but I did what he asked me to do. I was, I was faithful in the things that he asked me to do while I was walking through my trial. Um, so I think sometimes it's more about looking outward at what you can do in that circumstance than what God's gonna do for you.
I felt like, you know, even if I'm not healed, even if I don't, I'm not cancer free, even if I get sick and lose my hair, God's still good. And God still has a plan. And I'm okay with that. Uh, never in this journey did I ever question whether God could do it. I just wasn't sure I was worthy enough of it. And I still am not sure. I, I think that's a question I want to believe that I was. And I want to believe that it wasn't in vain. And God didn't leave me here so that I couldn't reach my hand down and grab someone else and help them through a situation uh, similar. So um, when you're faced with a mountain, you just ask God how he wants to use you. And he'll show you. It may not be the way you're thinking, but he'll show you in the little small details. He'll show you.